Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's Michael Rose here. I'm the chair of the Committee for Sydney. Welcome to uh, today's edition of Committee for Sydney Live. Um, thank you for joining us. Can I begin by acknowledging country? We're all um, joining this meeting from various places around Sydney and, and further away. Uh, I'm actually joining the uh, call this morning from Darkenjung country, north of Sydney. So I acknowledge the Darkenjung people, pay respect to their elders past and present. And uh, uh, on your behalf, acknowledge the traditional owners of all of the places that you are joining the meeting from. Uh, yesterday, the New South Wales government's federal financial relations review panel delivered its draft report to the New South Wales treasurer. And in that report, they uh, looked at uh, various possible reforms of the Australian uh, relationship between states and uh, the federal government uh, in relation to tax. One of the things that the uh, introduction to the draft report makes clear is that when the panel began its work, they began in the context of strong state finances and a growing economy. And while they were doing their work, um, two things happened. One was the national bushfire crisis and the other was the global pandemic. And so the, the context of the work that the panel has been doing has changed dramatically and the need for the reforms that they have been thinking about has been accelerated. We're really fortunate uh, today to have four of the uh, panel members, four of the authors of the draft report uh, with us uh, to speak about the report and to answer your questions. So um, we will uh, uh, look forward to hearing from them. I'm going to introduce the chair of the panel first and then I'll introduce the other panelists after he has spoken. Uh, and the chair of the panel is uh, David Thody. Uh, I think many of you will, will know David. Um, he uh, is a very well-known Australian businessman with extensive experience in the kinds of work that the panel has just done. Um, he is the current chair of the CSIRO. He's also uh, the deputy chair of the National COVID-19 COVID Coordination Commission. And um, I'll invite David to say a few things about the report and then we'll move on to questions. So David, over to you. Yeah, oh, well, thanks, Michael, and good morning to everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity and I'd just like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land which we're meeting uh, here in Canberra and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present. Well I, I, as Michael said I'm uh, pleased to be here and I've got Anne Toomey here who has been on the panel, Bill English sort of you know piping in from New Zealand uh, and also uh, John Freebam who's uh, coming in from uh, Victoria, and he is safe, I'm glad to say, and, uh, and managing the COVID outbreak there well. So as Michael said, you know, when we were asked to do this uh, in June last year, um, you know, it was a very different uh, situation. You know, we were looking at, you know, fiscal gaps out maybe, you know, 10 years away, but the New South Wales economy was very strong, as was the Australian economy. So it really, we really started this review as looking at you know, the, the foundations of the Federation and just how the financial relations worked. You know, what we hadn't realized that we'd be delivering this report pretty much 20 years to the day from when GST was introduced in Australia. So uh, already the press has picked up on GST element uh, very strongly, which is only one part of uh, our uh, recommendation or set of, um, of comments. But it is amazing that over that 20 year period, there really has been little really transformative in federal financial relations and uh, that whole area. There's been some tweaking. I mean, the biggest change has really been uh, the national cabinet that was set up in terms of federal relations with the states. Uh, you know, during the pandemic. So quite interesting when you start to reflect on how much change has really taken place. But we, we did reorient uh, as we started to write the report and we did 
try to focus in on about three things. You know, firstly, we thought that anybody who needed to better support the economic recovery uh, because that was going to be so important as we all go forward with what uh, 3.3 million people on uh, job uh, keeper and about one and a half million on uh, job seeker. Uh, also, secondly, to sustainably fund and deliver, you know, the essential service and infrastructure that we need in the states, and to maintain our quality of living in each state. And also, over the long term, we need to restore the financial capability of um, of each of the states. And uh, and there is going to be short term and long term initiatives. So. As we did that, we, we tried to apply some principles that uh, I think are important to consider. We wanted the reforms to be broadly revenue neutral. So this was not an increase in taxation, but broadly revenue neutral. Uh, secondly, we, it was more around the efficiency of the tax mix. So that was the second area. Uh, and in that, trying to shore up the eroding revenue base. And then I think lastly, uh, making sure that the federal financial relations were simpler and we would say more outcomes focused rather than process driven. Uh, I'll refer to that a little bit later on just in terms of the, some of the partnership agreements and some of you would have, will be familiar with some of the agreements between the uh, Commonwealth and states have got you know, quite voluminous and, and very small. Um, Inevitably, you know, we're looking at it from the New South Wales state uh, perspective, uh, but some of these reforms inevitably start to touch on uh, the Commonwealth as well. And because of the, the, you know, the relationship that exists between, um, between the Commonwealth and the funding with uh, VFI, et cetera. So uh, that's why we've sort of, you know, really started to address some of the uh, broader Commonwealth considerations. But I do want to say, um, you know, and we said this at the National Press Club, you know, tax reform is inherently difficult. Um, you know, nobody really likes talking around taxation. It takes real leadership to be willing to put it on the table because immediately the community sees what they will lose rather than what they're going to gain. Uh, and I think that it's very important to be able to put it in a wider context of what's in the best interest of the nation. And what I was really encouraged by the general conversation yesterday, and to many of the, many of the media reports, it has been within that context. Now, any individual tax reform needs to be considered on its own merits, but you do need to look at this, the wider interplay between all the different tax elements. And so we would call this more a blueprint. Uh, and I don't mean, while you might be able to do some tax reform on an individual area, uh, there will be implications that will touch other, uh, other bits and pieces. Um, so let me just briefly run through, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but just the general areas of uh, reform we've touched on. There's, you'd be glad there's only 15 recommendations, but um, you know they're very big recommendations. Let me quickly say that we didn't go to um, you know, 60 or 70, as some reports do. Firstly, just on federation reform, and Anne is eminently uh, capable to you know, expand on this, but we we did um, really applaud um, you know, the creation of the National Federation Reform Council and the National Cabinet. We do think this is um, you know, a great step forward, and we hope that it will continue. We think that COAG needed a bit of a, a revamp, and, and I think both the uh, state premiers and uh, chief ministers and the Prime Minister have found it a very effective uh, group, and I've seen it working for the National Commission. It's been, you know, quite encouraging to see the level of cooperation. But I would say that in a crisis, there's a common purpose, <laughs> and uh, therefore that brings people together. We need to keep that purpose, you know, strong. Uh, you know, we, you know, the, the principles of federation that Anne can talk to is more one of equals uh, coming together for the good of the country. Uh, and I think if that can, could, could continue, I think that would be a great step forward. I do notice also the Prime Minister has, has asked the Cabinet uh, and some of the Reform Councils to look at a number of these areas, and I think that's a very positive sign. And also, 
at the uh, roles and responsibilities between the Commonwealth and the state. Um, as you know, uh, subsidiarity is, you know, the, uh, you know, the form of government closest to the people should be really, you know, performing the work. And, uh, and I think that there's some opportunities to look at that and get greater, you know, reduction of uh, overlap and a little bit of bureaucracy that's uh, you know, settled in. And we think it'd be really worthwhile uh, to do that. Um, so, um, you know, the other bit which I alluded to has been some of these partnership agreements that, you know, in New South Wales, we have now 50 partnership agreements. I think uh, the last count, there's sort of about 18, less than, you know, 5 million, and, and yet they can take two years to negotiate. And we do introduce the idea of income tax sharing, um, which is interesting that um, it, you know, we think that that could be a better way to you know, basically sort of take a percentage of income tax allocate it to the state, and then the Prime Minister to write the Premier and say, here's the things we'd like you to do. That would be a lot more efficient than, you know, having 50 different sets of negotiations with literally hundreds of people involved uh, on with probably um, little impact, and also outcomes driven by in the process. Um, you know, we touch on GST reform. Um, you know, we are, I'm not quite sure if it's second or the third lowest you know, consumption tax uh, country within the OECD group, but we're very low. And uh, you compare us to New Zealand, I think New Zealand's at 30% of the tax code is now from a consumption tax, and we're sort of down around 6%. So it seems that we've just missed an opportunity um, to reform. Now, I, I can remember beans, you know, and Bill might talk to us. I can remember... Uh, you know, the story was, well, hey, we're going to reduce personal income tax, reduce corporate tax, simplify it, put more money in your pocket, but we're going to put in a consumption tax. And as a citizen, I thought, hey, that's a pretty good idea. I, I get to choose where I spend my money, and and I, it was a good balance. So I do think that it, it need we need to have that conversation because at the moment, um, you know, we have the highest income tax uh, in the OECD, or at least up there and a very high company tax relatively. And that can be a disincentive for many companies uh, and individuals. So I think there is an opportunity there about you know, economic growth. And I think that's the discussion we need to have. And, but at the same time, you know, I, we, we went out of our way to stress. We need to look after, um, you know, have the safety net and those that are, you know, need help, we need to look after them. And now I know that's always a difficult balance, but you know, I'm not sure if I could, well, I know I couldn't live off $40 a day and, you know, um, job seeker here in Australia, now, even though it's higher during this pandemic. Um, we did steer into payroll tax reform. We think payroll tax has been pretty effective. Um, it, it works pretty well. We just think that between every state, it's become so complicated and it's become a, a point of negotiation uh, with many companies. And we've got different, you know, different levels at which it comes in, different rates. And we're not saying we want total unanimity, but we think there should be some, um, some, you know, so, some principles by which, you know, for the greater good of Australia that we have the payroll tax reform. And look, the big one um, that I think, is, you know, many people look at is you know, you know, removal of stamp duty. We just think that that's not been a, an efficient tax. Uh, we think land tax is... Um, a far more efficient way to go it, for everybody involved. However, how you implement that is the challenge. And I'm sure many people uh, who are listening today will have some thoughts on that. And we're very interested to take that. We did not recommend a specific implementation approach. We laid out the pros and cons of different ones, but we did say that it should be implemented over time. We don't think it should be overnight. Uh, it's just too hard to do. And we've sort of seen various... Um, you know, examples where people have tried to do that or states have done that, and it does create a lot of problems. So, um, but we do think that it's important. I do want to stress that um, if, it, if we should not penalise the state for being progressive in their tax reform. Um, so one of the important things here, we, we did not go into HFE, uh, but we think that if a state does link for it, does the reform, they shouldn't be penalised that in some of the distributions of um, 
of the GST or other taxes or other revenues. Um, we touch on road funding. Um, there's a lot of work being done on that, and I do know that um, you, know, you, this group, has been very active in that and congestion. Um, our recommendation is we should trial congestion charging in Sydney. I'm not sure it's going to get up, but we can talk about that. Uh, but the road use is charging with electronic vehicles. I think let's try and get ahead of the changes. It's going to happen. Fuel excise tax is declining, and um, we should just sort of get on with it, I think. It would, the critical thing, it needs to be you know, consistent across the country, because uh, you can't... Well, it would be very difficult. Every state puts in a different uh, road use is charging. We're going to get you know, ourselves all mucked up again. I was just... Uh, talking to my son this morning who sold his car uh, to someone in Queensland. He said it's taken about three months just to get the paperwork sort of you know, process because the system is just so, you know, uh, unlinked, which, you know, for the sake of some arbitrary border, it doesn't seem right for a country like ours. That's not around fuel excess. That's pretty silly. Uh, um, look, we, we, we do talk about insurance tax reform. Um, you know, we think that the levies should, it's not an effective way of doing it. We'd like to see some cleaner way to do that. Uh, I know New South Wales has uh, considered that before and then had to step back from it, but we'd encourage them to, to move forward on that and find some way to, you know, a fairer way of uh, funding emergency services and the people who really do. And as you know, um, the insurance levels of uh, New South Welsh uh, citizens is lower than any other state. And uh, so there's been this sort of artificial, well, an artificial pressure down on people taking out house and uh, land insurance. So that was sort of really what we um, went through. I, I do want to stress that it's a draft. We're open to commentary, uh, and that's why we're running these sessions, and we really appreciate the committee for Sydney sort of stepping in and, and running and, and helping us get the message out. Um, and then we will probably in about you know, six weeks to a couple, maybe eight weeks, we'll put the final version together. It is a independent report and, and the treasurer can do what he, he or uh, the premier would like to do with it. But we do think that it's very important discussion and we want to see a, an open and, and vibrant discussion about this because these are complex issues, but uh, deserve our attention. So let me stop there, Michael, and then uh, you can lead us through some questions. Thanks very much, David. Uh, appreciate those, those comments. Um, so what I'll do now, ladies and gentlemen, is I'll introduce our other panelists. And while I'm doing that, perhaps you can start getting your questions ready and type them in, and then I can um, pass them on uh, to our panelists. So our, our other panelists this morning are Professor Anne Toomey, who's the Professor of Constitutional Law and the Director of the Constitutional Reform Unit at the University of Sydney. Good morning, Anne. Morning. Um, also joining us, Professor John Freeban, uh, who is the holder of the Ritchie Chair of Economics at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and he is an applied microeconomist and economic policy analyst um, with a long interest in taxation reform and public finance. Good morning, John. And Good morning. Uh, and also joining us this morning, and I think joining us from New Zealand, if I'm right, Bill, um, welcome, is Bill English, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand. Uh, and before he was the Prime Minister, he was the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance, had a long career, I think 28 years in uh, the Parliament of New Zealand, retiring in 2018. So, Bill, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, uh, I'm sure we will have a lot of questions from our audience, but let me, me uh, get started with some that touch on the, the various areas of the recommendations. And, and congratulations to all of you for a report that um, holds itself to 15 recommendations. It, it's actually, um, not only do you have uh, 15 recommendations, you then group them in ways which uh, allow people to really engage with them quickly. So thank you for that. Um, and the first four recommendations are grouped under a heading which speaks about um, the reform, or sorry, the evolution of federation in Australia and um, uh, contains what I think is a very mild uh, rebuke that um, the COAG process has um, been characterised more by conflict than by collaboration. Um, 
And as David mentioned, we've now seen a new spirit of collaboration arise in relation to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, do you uh, expect to see that continue? And perhaps more significantly, do you think that um, the new uh, national cabinet process can drive the necessary cultural change within state bureaucracies. It's one thing, I think, to get premiers making nice in front of the cameras. Can you, can you integrate state bureaucracies at the next level down? Indeed, and that's the really hard question. Uh, so um, we know previously, remember the Kevin Rudd reforms, you know, from 2007, 2008, uh, where he did all the stuff about stopping the blame game, but effectively all those things came back again. So they cut down the number of, um, you know, different agreements with the states to, you know, a small number, and it was all supposed to be based on outcomes and not process. Uh, and then the bureaucracy just um, took it back to large numbers of agreements, you know, small amounts negotiated over long periods of time, wasting a lot of resources. So it's very, very, very hard to get cultural change, even if you get um, change from the top. I think what though what's what is useful um, is that um, in some ways the pandemic has been quite helpful in this regard because it's shown people a number of things. It's shown that if you've got a common aim you can work effectively together so that's a good thing. Um, it's also shown I think to our political leaders that you can actually get more um, your standing can be raised through your cooperation with others. So it's not about cutting down other people. It's about you can actually be lifted up to the extent that you cooperate and achieve things together. And I think that's a really important political lesson. You know, up until now, we've had, you know, um, adversarial relationships between premiers and the prime minister and political parties and all the rest of it. But this has been a really good exercise in showing that cooperation can actually achieve greater support from the community and greater popularity. So that's been very helpful. Uh, so those processes might help push down into the bureaucracy and say, actually, we need to change the way that we do things so that we do achieve things more cooperatively. Third factor that's really important is the crisis factor. Um, as um, David said before, when we, we started this all off, uh, we thought that we had plenty of time to deal with these processes in the future. And now we've discovered we're right in the middle of a crisis. So that's enough to put pressure on all the states to want to obtain some kind of reform and to know that we can only really do this cooperatively. Um, so that also might push through some change. In terms of the National Cabinet itself, um, one of the interesting developments is um, by meeting virtually and again, that was a, a consequence of a pandemic, an unpredictable thing. But the experience of it, I think, has been really successful. So we've seen the fact that um, the Prime Minister and the Premiers can get together personally and confidentially and talk about issues on a really regular basis without having all the drama of travelling to Canberra and wasting time on planes and in airports and making a big to-do out of it and having a big set piece for the media and all the rest of it. All that was wiped out. It's way more efficient if you can just do one meeting online and then go and head, do the rest of your work. Um, and that suggests that we might end up with a system where you actually do have these more regular meetings of the Prime Minister and the Premiers. You can build up trust, you can build up relationships, can have a genuine conversation about here are actually the real problems that we face without going through sort of you know um, enormous numbers of briefing papers and bureaucracy and all the rest of it which had just clogged up coag in a big way uh, so keeping on that sort of stuff will be really useful in the future the one thing that really worries me about it and this is mentioned in the report is the structure they created for it so as a matter of convenience and urgency, they created the structure of um, this thing as a um, committee of the Commonwealth Cabinet. Um, and it's a committee that, according to the Cabinet Handbook, has a membership of one. The Prime Minister is the only permanent member. The Prime Minister gets to control who all the members are. The Prime Minister gets to control when meetings are held, what's on the agenda, and According to the Cabinet Handbook, the Cabinet, the Commonwealth Cabinet can overturn any decisions of this body. Look, that's just not acceptable. It's not the way an intergovernmental body should be working. 
it should be a, um, a, a body of equals because that's been the success of national cabinet so far is that people have been treated with respect as equals. We did see the prime minister say those things like, well, when it comes to schools, you actually should pay attention to what the premier of your state says. You know, the fact that there was recognition that states actually had a legitimate role in all of this was really important. So it doesn't make sense to put it in a structure which is completely controlled by the Commonwealth Prime Minister and no one else. Um, so that needs structural change. Um, and, you know, that is a process that they can look through. Now, I can understand why they did that in an emergency as a one-off thing. But if we're going to keep this thing, we need it to be a council of equals that is an intergovernmental body which has its own independent secretariat where all the states can participate in terms of what's on the agenda, what you're going to be speaking about, how often you're speaking, when your meetings are, all those sorts of things, because they are equals. They are all leaders of jurisdictions that participate in this body. And if you have that level of respect and cooperation, then you might actually achieve something. So, you know, fingers crossed. Thanks, Anne. Um, a, a couple of questions that we have are focused on um, issues of fairness and social equity in the expansion of the of the GST, which is something you touched on, David, in your remarks and something which has been picked up a little in the media today. The, the, the risk that expanding the reliance on GST and the, and the rate of GST uh, may have a disproportionate impact on lower income earners who, who um, spend more of their income on, on consumer items. Um, John, I was wanting to just ask you about that. The, the draft report talks of ensuring that there's um, compensation or, or you know, relevant adjustments made to, to address that risk. Um, what, what actually can be done to um, address that risk for people who are on welfare or who are sitting below um, the minimum tax thresholds in Australia? Is that a is, are there complexities there that will really need a lot of attention? It's, it's very important and, and it's quite complex. But the truth of the matter is uh, we learned a lot of doing that when we brought in the GST in 2000. And so what you can uh, estimate is how much a broader GST or a higher rate pushes up the cost of living. And so for people on uh, welfare payments, uh, you can build in a one-off increase in new start, the age pension, disability pension, and so on. So they can be adequately compensated. People who have got uh, low income that's below the threshold between the zero and 20,000, and who are not on welfare payments, they're very hard to uh, look after. One has to, I think, argue that many of those people are in transition. Yes, they'll lose for a while, but they'll get out of it. And then the people who are higher up, you know, say earning 30, 40,000 a year, you can, uh, as part of the package, uh, reduce the income tax rate so that uh, they're spending a little bit more by the GST but they've got a little bit more in disposable income. So that's the way it's been done in the past, uh, the way it's been done in other countries, and uh, that's the way we would uh, think about doing this model down the track. Thanks, John. Um, Bill, are there any lessons for us from New Zealand in, in, in relation to this, and you know, in terms of how you get the GST to work harder while still ensuring that it, it, it drives equitable outcomes across the community? I think you're still on mute, Bill. John has covered the core um, arguments. A couple that I'd add, one is that um, you don't necessarily expect everyone to buy into this argument, but you're, the whole point of doing a change in your tax mix is the dynamic effect. And that is that you're going to reduce the cost of taxation in your community and get more jobs and growth. And that's going to be at a premium over the next few years in Australia. Uh, and those, um, I think it's 
reasonably clear in New Zealand when we did it, did it in 2010 when we put the rate up that, that those benefits did actually accrue through the rebalancing um, less income tax and more consumption tax. The second thing is that you can calculate the uh, equity impact. Um, this is an obvious argument <clears throat> and I think unless unless or until you have a pretty good look at the equity impact, people are going to believe that it is inequitable. Uh, and you, um, but, there, but that is an argument that can be um, made transparent. Uh, and that then of course leads to a more, a stronger focus on um, whether your compensation, where your compensation measures are effective or not. The third point I make is that the, the group who are, are in this ta the tax-free zone in Australia, uh, remember, if they're, if they're um, eligible, if, if they're part of the workforce or potentially part of the workforce, then they're in the benefits system, they're in the welfare system, and you can compensate them, um, compensate them directly. Uh, others who are earning, you know, less than ten thousand dollars are uh, uh, in majority in households where the incomes are considerably higher, or where there are other earners who can be compensated. So, you know, students on part-time work, um, children who are earning um, a secondary earner uh, who's on part-time work. Now, all of these have been, um, all of this has been mixed up by the the unemployment hit, which has been big in Australia, much bigger than the official figures. Uh, so that, that um, changes the environment, but, but nevertheless, uh, when you dig into who's in those low income brackets, it's, in the first place, it's, there's not as many, uh, you know, these people are not on their own on this 7,000 a year of income. Uh, and, and where they are, uh, then, in the tax system you've got where in you know, Australia just had a big investment in the administration side of it, you've got the tools to reach them uh, in the context of the wider benefits you want um, from changing the tax mix. Thanks, Bill. Um, David, one of the points that the, the draft report uh, makes and which you made in your opening remarks was that you want to be careful not to penalise states for um, attempting progressive reforms, um, which is something that um, the, the Treasurer uh, has said a number of times when he's been speaking with our members. And, and I suppose he yeah. thinks about it in two ways. He thinks about the um, what he would describe, I think, as the inequities of the current system where um, uh, states um, that uh, take on not only um, financial reforms but deep structural reforms um, uh, come out um, less well in the allocation of the of the GSC funds. Um, you, your comments really go to not penalising um, the uh, financial reforms but how important is it to, to link those to both the, the, the financial reforms and deeper structural reforms around industrial policy and, and economic policy and, and even land use policy in the states? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think they're all related as, as you point out, Michael. I mean, I think firstly I'd say, I think everyone signs up to the bigger principles of the Federation, uh, which is, you know, it's the, the distribution of of having good good education, good health in all states, and therefore, and all states are not equal, and there is a responsibility of the you know largest states to you know shoulder more of the burden. So I think that's important, and that's an important principle that we should keep. That's part of the federation. Um, I, I think that you know inevitably with the deeper structural reform, um, you know, hopefully that does you know play out in a stronger economy, therefore stronger taxes and uh, or stronger revenues and therefore stronger taxes and therefore, you know, if a state is does particularly well in that area, then well they will contribute greater in, a, in many different ways. Um, I think also, um, you know, we don't want to stifle competition between the states and, and Anne can talk to this. I mean, that's part of the federation and you know that 
that rub of uh, different states doing things differently. There should be good sharing and therefore an encouragement to deliver, you know, better health care at a lower cost, being innovative, you know, driving change, etc. Um, there are sometimes intended or perverse, you know, sometimes of a state doing that, um, you know, in terms of them being penalised. And I think there's many different ways you can look at it, but I think we've got to have some awareness of that as that happens uh, and then make sure that, you know, that structure reform isn't penalised. And I mean, healthcare is a classic one where, you know, we, you know, we're so much driven by, you know, this intervention healthcare in hospitals um, and yet we're not looking at total well-being and therefore you, know, you get socially disadvantaged to have greater health problems and then that flows through into great intervention uh, in the health system and so we need to be able to find ways that we look at the total picture for the betterment of you know the community and individuals i don't know and you may have a comment on that one as well um, yes, one of the things about federalism that people sometimes don't quite get is that you need to work out the areas in which you want competition because competition actually really helps drive, you know, greater efficiency, greater reform, etc. But you also need to work out the areas in which you need uniformity. And the great thing about federalism is that you can have both. You know, you can say, right, here are the certain things we need things to be uniform for the purposes of being able to efficiently run a business where, you know, these certain sorts of things need to be the same. So you can have your business operate over the whole country and deal with these things on an equal level. You also need to understand that in some circumstances, competition between the states is unhealthy. So for example, you know, with payroll tax is, is an example. You can end up with a race to the bottom where everybody ends up disadvantaged in terms of just not being able to have the level of taxes needed to support them because they're all keep competing with each other. And that's just stupid, right? But then there are other areas where you really do need the competition. You need the people to make the reforms in the hospitals to make it more efficient. And one state needs to be able to say, well, hang on a minute, that state over there is doing better than us. Why are they doing better? And can we do what they do? And then maybe improve upon that. Um, and so when I was a public servant, we used to get this stuff all the time. The Premier would say, well, you know, why is Victoria doing better in terms of, you know, workers' compensation and their premiums are lower or whatever it is? Find out what they're doing, at least do that, and then see if you can improve upon it. And that's this ratcheting up process, which is the great thing about federalism. Um, the key thing in all of this is whenever you talk about competition and federalism, everyone will give you the bad example of where, federal, where you shouldn't have competition. But what I say about federalism is you, the, the important thing is to discern what are the th things where competition is really helpful and good and what are the sorts of things where you need uniformity or at least a level of cooperation. And, and if you can do that and get that right, you've got a brilliant system of government. Well, 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 just on that point, that um, uh, competition versus uniformity, uh, one of the things you do touch on in the report is the importance of harmonisation in relation to a number of things, um, in including, for example, um, road pricing and, and uh, what have you. Um, uh, how, do, how, do you, how do you keep things out of the competitive bucket? Do you, is, is that something that's done through the through the national cabinet process? Um, yeah, I think it should be. I mean, that's, I mean, everybody remembers the ridiculous rail gauge problem from when, you know, we started with railways and each state decided to make their tracks different so your train couldn't go from one state to another, okay? Everyone recognises that's really, really stupid, okay? And so we gotta keep that in mind when we do these sorts of things. So yeah, if you are having a system for, um, uh, taxing people according to how far they travel on roads. We know cars are going to move over state borders. It would be completely bonkers to have different systems in different states. So you need some kind of a ministerial council under, you know, the, the aegis of the national cabinet or whatever it's going to be called. Um, you need these councils underneath that deal with road systems or whatever to make sure that you're all using the same kinds of basic principles to measure distance and how you do it or the same sorts of technology or that <coughs> it's compatible. 
Um, all that stuff is sort of screamingly obvious in terms of what you need to do in relation to things where you do cross borders and you don't want to add in a whole lot of inefficiencies. So yes, definitely that sort of thing needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, back to you if I can. A, a lot of our members have a, a very particular interest in, in transport and mobility and, uh, and therefore um, real interest in some of the recommendations in, in relation to um, road funding and, and electric vehicles. Uh, an interesting quote from the head of the Electric Vehicles Association, who, who may not have come to this completely neutrally, but they described taxing electric vehicles as the equivalent of um, a tax, a taxing nicotine patches during an anti-smoking campaign. Um, I'm not sure that's fair, but um, could, would you be able just to expand a little bit on the thinking around, um, you know, why it is so critical to, to, to move to a new model which recognises the changing nature of vehicles and, and how critical it will be to harmonise that across the country. Yes, well, what we have at the moment is a very ad hoc set of taxes on the use of motor vehicles. So you've got the Commonwealth uh, charging excise and that falls on uh, all petroleum products that are on uh, road use, but exemptions for off-road use. The states then have a mixture of uh, registration fees, uh, stamp duties on transfer, parking fees, licenses, and so on. When we think about, ideally, how would you want to charge people for using motor vehicles? You'd want to pick up three types of uh, social costs. The first one is the use of the roads that are largely government funded. Yes, there are a few toll roads, but mostly it's government funded. Uh, secondly, you'd want to uh, charge the external costs of congestion. And thirdly, you would want to have a charge for the external costs of pollution. And basically those existing taxes don't meet either of those social costs very sensibly. So what we've proposed in the report is to look quite seriously at a user charge and their electric vehicles use roads just like petrol and diesel driven vehicles. And so the fuel excise is not very sensible for them at that stage. So that's saying getting that fixed up. If you come to congestion, an electric vehicle is gonna cause as much congestion as a petrol driven vehicle. So you'd want to treat them the same. The difference comes is when you talk about pollution, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. And assuming that electrical vehicles are using renewables or nuclear, then they wouldn't get caught up in the pollution charge. So what we have in mind is sensibly working to a, um, a road user charge and as uh, David and Anne have just discussed, you would generally want that to be pretty much national and you would want it to be linked to the kilometres travelled and the amount of damage that's done per vehicle. And then um, I think you can experiment for the individual cities on what's the best way to set up a congestion charge and uh, you know, new technology is making all sorts of things uh, worth considering. And then the pollution charge would really be you know, thought seriously as part of the general uh, greenhouse gas emissions policy. So that's the framework that we have in mind. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm not sure who this question is, is intended for, but I'll actually <laughs> offer it to all of you. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's a question that goes to um, the Alain Dupre principles, which are set out in the report, the 10, the 10 principles for the assignment of roles and responsibilities, um, which uh, is, is a great thing. I think the committee for Sydney might actually go around and start pinning these up on every um, uh, government office that we visit. But um, one, of the, one of those principles talks about... Um, uh, 
allowing for pilots and asymmetric uh, arrangements. So um, this idea that you should you know, maybe get started on a few things in a few different places and see how they work. Um, has the committee turned its attention to any any things that might be piloted? As if you had any you know, any discussions with government around things that it's particularly interested in, in taking a look at and, and 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 might get started with, even though the conversation is still taking place. Maybe David, I'll start with you on that. Well, I think the income tax sharing was one of them, um, and. Uh, <coughs> New South Wales, where well, we were recommending New South Wales put their hand up for that. Um, but there needs to be a lot of work done on that. Look, uh, the trialling of congestion we set for Sydney. Um, uh, now, there's a lot of considerations in that, and but we will encourage them to think about that. And I think that were the two main you know, ones that we referred to. Um, look, but there is opportunities, obviously, with land tax. I mean, uh, there's different implementation approaches to land tax. Um, we've seen ACT, uh, who are now going to an election and probably reviewing exactly how they implemented it. Uh, but I think that there's, that's what we need to work through, and Victoria may do it slightly differently. We're not asking for total uniformity in any of that, but I think that that's, uh, as Anne was saying, that's the beauty of the Federation. There's slightly different implementations, but in some areas. Um, by the way, I was just thinking here as Anne was talking about where there needs to be uniformity across the country. And, you know, we were from the National Commission looking at COVID ready workplaces and uh, then, you know, confronted with uh, OHS regulations again, state by state, and just how difficult it is. And gee, I, I just don't understand why we can't get that sort of fix because it makes it so difficult. I remember at Telstra, it was just, you know, uh, just made it life far more complicated. And uh, you just, so in the end, you just go to the highest level and make sure you're covered off everything. But I do think that they are the sorts of things that we can become more effective and efficient as a nation. Um, so that was some of the things I don't know. And do you remember any others? I think that was the main ones that we touched on in terms of piloting and against our point eight in the alignment side, alignment of roles and responsibilities. Well, just picking up your point, David. I'll take uh, that as a yes. <laughs> well, Anne nodded, so I, I took it as a yes as well. <laughs> yes, 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 right. <laughs> so uh, just on your point about um, uh, implementation of, of the land tax. Um, so yeah. The committee's been advocating for land tax um, for a while, not only because it, it's it's um, a, a better way to, to approach the taxing of land, but also because it, it encourages yeah. more efficient use of land and and provides yeah. an environment for things like build to rent and what have you. Um, and uh, John, this might be one for you also. How, how do you, one of the things that's been talked about um, by our state government is the notion that maybe you'll have opt-in that you, you could choose. Are you a person who's, you know, regularly selling properties? Are you a person who's staying put? Um, um, is, is that really a realistic uh, set of uh, option for, for transition? And, and, and if, if not, um, what are the other ways in which it can be done other than just by way of big bang? Um, could I just I'm add, not only is John, do that one. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Not, not only is the, is the current stamp duty very inefficient and, and distorting, it's also extremely unfair. So somebody who sits in their own home for 50 years may not ever have paid stamp duty or only paid it once. Whereas somebody who changes their property every, say, 10 years will have paid stamp duty five or six times over their life. And yet both those families are enjoying government provided health, education, infrastructure and so on. And so this has got to be a very important part of the fairness debate is having an annual land tax where regardless of whether you buy and sell your house every decade or stop it forever, you make the same contribution 
to uh, government's health and education. To turn to your question of the transition issue, the problem we're trying to get over is somebody who just bought a property last year or a year ago would have paid stamp duty and then we're saying to them, you're also going to have to pay this new land tax. So one of the transition issues we want to get over is to reduce that so-called double taxation story. And in my view, there are two credible ways of doing that. One is to do what the ACT has done, and that is to gradually reduce the stamp duty rate and steadily increase the new annual land tax rate. And so that's roughly revenue neutral and um, you know, slowly gets us onto the more efficient system. An alternative strategy is to give people credit for having paid stamp duty at recent times. So you might give uh, people who paid stamp duty the last year a 50% credit against the new uh, land tax. If they bought it three years ago, you give them a 20 or a 30%. And if they bought it more than five years ago, you don't give them any credit. Now that has the advantage that you get straight on to the efficiency incentives and payoffs, but you do have a shortage of revenue over that transition period. Now people have suggested the way you can overcome that is you have a slightly revenue positive uh, reform package down the track and the state can borrow over that uh, three to five transition period and break even. I worry about the voluntary opt-in, opt-out one mm. for the following reasons. You're going to wait for a heck of a long time to catch up on the revenue and it's still going to be inequitable. You know, people are going to make choices to stop with stamp duty if they think they're going to be in the property for a very, very long time. And that's just not getting the efficiency story right. So my, uh, you know, I think the really serious transition options are either the ACT type model or giving some credit for recently paid um, stamp duty. The other important part of a transition story is to look after the so-called people with liquidity problems. People who often say asset rich and income poor, or as we've now experienced with the pandemic, people who are unexpectedly thrown into unemployment or have bad health. I think we've, we've suggested that as uh, people can defer their rates, uh, you might be able have the option to defer the payment of the new uh, land tax, but that would be carried forward at the government borrowing rate so that it's roughly revenue neutral for the government and equitable for people who pay on time versus those who are liquidity constrained and drag it out to a more convenient time. Thanks, John. Um, David, did you have a, uh, I'm just watching you, did you have a, more you wanted to say about that? No, I think John, John answered it very well. Um, no, it, it, it's, uh, I mean, there's obviously uh, a number of, uh, you know, no cons to that approach, but there's some positives in terms of just uh, introducing it into the community. So I think that's what government are going to have to work through. Um, one of the uh, points you make in relation to um, payroll tax in, in that section of your report, um, there's a headline, um, exemptions make relatively efficient taxes less efficient. Um, to, and that, that's something that applies not only to payroll tax, obviously, but to all of the things you've addressed in your report. Um, to, to what extent um, will, will you be urging on government that, that this notion that you know the, the whole point here is to move towards clearer less complex more efficient and um there, there really needs to, as much as possible to try and avoid you know carving out too much right at the front and, and reintroducing just a new layer of complexity david 
Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, very much so. I mean, I think the cleaner and simpler we can make this, the better. So, I mean, as with all this, I mean, I, I think Bill might be able to talk about in New Zealand the number of taxes they removed. Even when we introduced GST, we removed a number of, you know, uh, different taxes. And I think the simpler you can give it, the easier it is for everybody, more efficient, more effective, simpler to understand. So, um, you know, if we have this opportunity to do a bit of redesign, I think that's where we should go. Um, maybe, you know, Bill, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but New Zealand's got a pretty clean tax system now and has actually avoided introducing too many new ones over the period as well. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it stayed, it has got you know, simpler and has stayed remarkably free of um, change, even though every election there's people promising uh, deductions and exemptions and so on, they never quite stick. Uh, I mean, the, the kind of issues that you're talking about are about simplicity, the ones that John raised about transitions. Uh, you, ha you need to see in the context of economic management from here for the next five to 10 years. You know, you're in an economy where real unemployment is already 12 or 13 percent in Australia. Mm. Uh, it's going to look like it's going down for a while, but there's going to be a big hard lump of it. And if you think about managing to get, how are you going to manage to get better growth than would other, that than would normally happen? Um, and if you think the transition issues are, are a bit complicated and they are, then you just think, is, is it worth it for the payoff? And the payoff now looks a lot higher than it would have six months ago. Uh, the mm. alternative is to say transitional issues around changing our tax mix are too complicated. So we're going to take the biggest single lever a government has and put it to one side. And then we're going to try and create a future for all these people who've lost their jobs and businesses that have been destroyed with the other little levers we've got. And that looks to me to be um, just a much more difficult management job trying to, because a lot of people are going to need some sense of hope and, hope and direction. So, you know, this is the transition issue, which is the only, the main objection, of course, and, and to, to these proposals and, and a legitimate one. Uh, it's just ones you've got to keep in proportion and back yourself a bit on being able to manage them. The, the tools for mm. managing those transitions are much better now than they were even 10 years ago and we put GST up because a lot of the, the challenges are just purely administrative and transaction cost and the ability to deal with those, say, in your, um, in your, uh, in your tax administration is just much cheaper and more effective than it used to be. And, and, and often these discussions talk about the transitions in principle and what, what you need to do is get a good look at the practicality of the kind of compensation or adjustment mechanisms that you would need. And all I'm saying is that practicality uh, is probably more manageable than people realise. Mm. Yeah, I think it's up to you. Thanks, Bill. Um, we have a, a question uh, around the emergency services levy as it's applied to local governments. Uh, and the, the point being made that uh, about 12% of um, the uh, combined ESL budget is made up um, by levies on local governments, which are then passed through to ratepayers. Uh, is that something that you um, did take a look at or is, it, is, is your recommendation in relation to a fire services property levy, would that, in your mind, would that, would that replace all the existing streams of revenue into the ESL? Okay, John, are you okay to take that one? Uh, okay, yeah, so one of the real problems with uh, the ESL as it now is, is it's tied to insurance premiums. And we know that there are quite a lot of people who are either not insuring or underinsuring. And so this is a reasonably inequitable tax. Um, it also increases the costs of insurance and in some sense induces people not to insure or underinsure. And so what we have proposed is that uh, ESL uh, levy be, 
disbanded. The question is, what would you use to replace the revenue? Uh, one option is to build it into the um, the larger land tax uh, replace uh, conveyance duty package. Another one would be if the GST was made a bit bigger, would be uh, to fund it that way, much as the 2000 GST package got rid of uh, special taxes on financial transactions. So we've left it as sort of options as to how you replace that revenue. Uh, but the review has said this is a fairly inequitable tax, it's an inefficient tax, and it's a complexity that you can get rid of. Thanks, John. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's good that we've uh, finished on inefficiency because I've just noticed how inefficient I've been as the, <laughs> chair, as the chair of this meeting. Uh, <laughs> And we've run out of time. So uh, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap up, um, despite the fact that we have more questions um, that remain unanswered and uh, and many fascinating things to consider. Um, uh, can I just say to the panellists, um, many of the things that you're advocating in the draft report are things that the committee has been focused on for a while. Um, yep. We put out something yesterday um, uh, expressing our really strong support for what it is you're doing and we'll be encouraging our members um, to continue that support. So thank you for the invitation to keep contributing. Uh, more importantly, um, thank you very much to the four of you for joining us today. Thanks members for tuning in. Um, let's give ourselves a big virtual round of applause. Um, and uh, again, thanks very much to our guests and we'll see you at the next one of these events. Thank you, David. Thanks, Thank Dan. you, Michael. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, great. Thank you.